In Orkney, we used to have an expression, I'll be hour with the moon, meaning that I will come and visit you when the moon is full to light my way. balancing a ball on the end of your nose. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Anyway. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> what we wanted to talk about today is, I guess we might say, your your unlikely um, story of how you got from farm boy to storyteller, art, author, um, museum person. BBC go-to guy, all things that you never would have planned or expected. No, it was all calculated from the beginning. Oh, was oh, it? Oh, yeah, I'm wow. cold. I am. I had all that figured out. Mm-hmm. Good. Oh, yeah. I had all my little life stages that, you know, do this by that time, kill that person by that time, you know, all those normal things that you do. And it's all gone according to plan. Absolutely, yeah. I've never found the bodies. <laughs> so, hmm. But yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> what, what were we saying again? What was your first question, Dolly? <laughs> we wanted to talk about how you ended up in museum work and being an author and being a storyteller who's traveled around the world. When, when you started out, you never would have expected any of those things, especially being dyslexic and uh, not very nurtured in your school setting at that time yeah that's kind of putting it mildly um well you have to remember that when i was born in 1963 and when i started going to school in the, the late 60s um dyslexia was unknown so you were just regarded as slow and stupid and uh, so I remember being slightly resentful of having this really boring reading book about a um, boy and a girl or something like mm-hmm. that. Was it Dick and Jean, was it? I have absolutely no idea wh- what it was. Uh, the boy was a bit of a decorate enough, so possibly, but I have no idea. The one thing that I really resented, so <laughs> more than anything, was that this dull book where nothing happened, uh, the other kids got to go on to another book, and it was about a giant who lived in a castle, and it had proper drawings, whereas the crap one I had had photographs. I mean, imagine, photographs. I was beside myself with envy, because I kept having to go up and do this thing, and I kept stumbling over the same words. didn't matter how many times I learnt them, I just stuck on them, and it made no sense at all to me. Mm. And uh, But they had a story, mm. you know, a proper story where begin, the middle, and the end. And, uh, and I wanted a bit of that instead of just somebody going to a shop or something, you know, dull. So did you finally graduate beyond the boring book, <clears> or did that have to wait until you were... I'm still reading it. <laughs> 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 um, no, I did manage to, to graduate on from s- to something a bit more interesting. But, um, yeah, it was uh, a bit of an uphill struggle. So, But the thing is, I, I always loved stories. And you told me that there were a couple of times at least that your brother Jim took you to the picture shows and you would see something like Snow White or something mm-hmm. fantastic and 
and yeah, fantastic. And you would get um, picture books sometimes, and Liz would look at them with you and read the stories to you. And so you had some mm-hmm. support at home from your older siblings. Yeah. Um, without my brothers and sister, then I, I would have been in a quite a bad place, really. Uh, yeah, I was went to the to the the pictures as we called it, you know, the the, the cinema. Uh, with Jim about, you know, not that often, uh, about three times or so, but I mean, it was such an event, you know. And Memorable. Yeah, so I think the first one was uh, um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And then there was Sleeping Beauty, which I still have a great affection for because I remember being so blown away by the size of it, the the illustrations, you know, the animation, the color, the sound, everything was just like overwhelming almost. I was just like, oh, I love that. And then also as well, Robin Hood, which was a new film at the time. The other ones were were old by that time, but um, uh, Robin Hood was, was brand new and it was just, I, was, I loved it and I, I still do, I have to confess. Hmm. So that was a big, a big thing. Mm. And my brother Dave used to buy me comics, quite a, quite a few comics actually, every week, out of his wages. Um, now, I know that he actually liked to read them as well, <laughs> but um, that was a major thing because I couldn't read. It took me a long time to learn to read. And what age were you about at this time? Oh, mid thirties probably. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I was you know in single figures, um, or maybe coming up for kind of ten or eleven or whatever. But um, getting comics like the Bino, the Dandy, the Beezer, the the Sparky, you know, the Topper, all these things that are like well, apart from the first two, all the rest of them are long gone, I mm-hmm. suppose. Um, and it was, uh, you were entering into a world of a story that was told in pictures. So I was very much of the hieroglyph school of comic reading. You know, you look at the pictures and that's it. And then my sister Liz used to read them to me as well. And I also then started to try to pick up and read it myself because I always loved books, which is kind of weird it seems I struggled with them so much mm-hmm. but um, it almost could have driven you the other direction too because the books were a source of trauma in school mm. for you yeah there was one <coughs> there was one book called Little Fisher Duckling which I could have wrung that duck's neck you know very happily um, I remember nothing about the story other than this condescending little shit of a duck <laughs> was swimming around with his brothers and sisters and such like. And I always stuck on the same words. I couldn't get beyond that. Did you have to read it aloud in front of the class? Yeah. Oh. And, uh, well, you had to read it to the teacher, but of course everybody could hear you. Right. And uh, then, you know, you would be pulled up and you'd have to do the reading with the teacher. And, uh, and then it would be like, well, you'll have to do that again tomorrow. And then, you know, so I was kept back in the same story for the longer. And in the end, my mother, who was also really kind of at the end of her tether with me as well, because she thought I was just not trying, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, so she she declared one day that if I came home <laughs> that night with Little Fisher Duckling to do the next day, then she wasn't doing it, and she was, like, furious. And so... I said this to the teacher, who said that she was sure that I was never told that at all. You oh. know. And um, but then the next day I got the next story, so we got beyond him. Uh, so yeah, it was. But you still struggled, uh, and in, in those days they didn't really mm. understand about dyslexia. No, no, that was that so. There was, was no help. No, well, there was encouragement in the form of beatings. Yes. Um, 
but uh, other than that, no. Um, but the ironic thing is that I loved books. I always have been drawn to books. I have no idea why. It's just that's my DNA, you know. Were there some books that you were particularly moved by? Oh, yeah. There's, I've actually dragged a couple out. Um, just to, to, to wave around. It seems yeah. it's audio. I we're just like doing it. the audio version, but uh, on the YouTube version, we'll maybe add some some pictures of of these books if you'd like to see them. Go to YouTube. Well, my sister got this, Liz, got this book um, as a um, prize at some school thing, you know. Uh, it's called A First Book of Favourite Fairy Tales Published by Nelson. And it's about 1965. Mm, looks like it. And the version that we had didn't actually have a dust jacket, which this one does. But inside there is uh, the a first book of favorite fairy tales, The Swan Princess, Beauty and the Beast, Snow White and Rose Red, and The Snow Queen. And The Snow Queen was the one that really blew me away. Uh, the Swan Princess was illustrated by Raymond Briggs. And I think from his kind of story, it was one of the first commissions that he ever did. Oh. And uh, so, of course, this is Raymond Briggs of snowman fame and such like. So, but there's one picture in, in that of the Snow Queen that I loved of the Snow Queen at the windows, you know, drawing the frost flowers on the panes of glass with her fingers and she's mm. all sort of made long of snow. scary looking fingers too it's not it's not well, a well i thought she was the most beautiful thing that i had ever seen oh. when i was a small kid and there she is drawing her frost ferns with her long pointed nails that's beautiful and i just i was utterly blown away by that illustration and another one that was um ladybird book the Elves and the Shoemaker from the Well Loved Tales series. Um, I remember getting that as a way of shutting me up on one of those trip days that we used to do to the North Isles. Oh, because long, long days. Oh, yeah, you'd catch the boat about six in the morning or something like that. And then <coughs> you sailed all around the islands. And the last one that we got to was Westry, and that's where we were going, because my mother came to Westry. And you were out visiting relatives then? Visiting her sister, my auntie mm. Mimo. And um, so that took you up until, like, lunchtime. It was about six hours. Is it any different now? I mean, because when I, when I <laughs> first thought about coming here to visit, I had the impression that the <coughs> fairies were like buses, where you, you could get on at one island and you could go to, you know, it'd stop at different islands on the way. Every few minutes you'd be at another island. I mean, t completely, mm. obviously, <laughs> ignorant. Uh, I just didn't know. No. Um, if you want to go for Sandy to Westry, you have to do it via Kirkwall and catch another ferry. Um but this was with the old Arcadia, who was the ship at the time. Um, it was much, much smaller than the, the ferries now. And of course, they weren't Roro ferries. They had to mm -hmm. cars being taken, had to be craned on uh, into the hold. You should explain what Roro means for people. Roll on, roll off. So you drive on one end of the boat and you drive off the other end. Um, that didn't exist at that time. So. They had to uh, use a crane for us to lift the car up and put it into the hold. And um, but then when we had our sort of, you know, you, you spent um, from about six thirty to twelve thirty, you go in, and um, then you left again about four or half past four. And you had to go all around the islands <laughs> in reverse. 
and it took forever, you know, like when you're a small kid, you know. Um, so the elves and the shoemaker was a way of trying to keep me occupied. It worked, didn't I it? I was such a slow <laughs> reader, it probably took me the 12 hours. To <laughs> but I read it over and over and, and absolutely loved it. Another one which was um, <coughs> sort of quite a fundamental for me as being basically a feral kid who hated school was this book Sula by Lavinia Derwant, who I believe wrote the uh, Tammy the Troot stories. I, I don't remember them, but Bryce is, uh, was a fan when he was tiny. Mm. So, uh, But it's about a boy who lives on a small island, um, has a, a seal as kind of a friend, totem animal, and, uh, and he's, he's wild. And instead of sort of going to school, he runs on the shore and hangs out with a selkie pal. And uh, I completely got that. And he loved nature. And uh, that reflected a lot in uh, how, you know, who I was mm -hmm. as well. Because you used to go around in the fields and mm -hmm. stake out the bird nests and mm -hmm. peg them so they wouldn't get trampled on. Well, it wasn't to get trampled on. It was to go and, and look at them. Watch their progress. You had a, a stick shoved in the ground, but it was at a distance mm. from where the nest was so that it didn't frighten the, the mother, which it never did. And then you could go and, uh, and watch the, you know, go and look at the, uh, the eggs because they were just beautiful. And then some days you would, you know, you'd find the, they were hatching or they had hatched and there was a couple of tiny little uh, tea whoppos or chaldros was the two ones or, you know, um, lap wings and oyster catchers were the two main ones. Was it oyster catchers? We The first time I was visiting you, we were driving yeah. down a, a side road and mm -hmm. we saw two or three little little oyster catchers running down the road in front of us. And they're the ones that just basically hatch and then get up and run away. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yeah, they all, they all do because it's, it's dangerous mm. to be all stuck together there. And a lot of the birds here are ground nesting birds mm -hmm. because there aren't many trees. Yeah, well, no, these are all waders, so yeah. they're all ground nesters. They, some of them even on the beach, so you have to be very mm -hmm. careful walking on the beach. The camouflage is so good that you just don't see them until you're almost standing on them, so you have to be very careful. And the same with the eggs as well. The eggs are beautifully camouflaged. Mm. But then they, they run off, they split up and go in different directions um, and just... But they stay close to each other, but hiding in clumps of grass. Mm -hmm. And then the parents come and feed them. So it's... Uh, so you don't need to worry about them if you see them running down the road like we did. You just leave no, them alone. No, no, you leave them alone. And uh, I think on that occasion, I actually stopped and, and picked them up and put them... You put them off the road. At the side of the yeah. road because they didn't have... They kind of wet about them to actually get run to the side, um, and maybe the grass verge would have been like a, a rampart to them, you know. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, you have to look out for nature. It's it needs all the help it can get. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even when we were plowing fields when I was a kid, if there was a nest, they would stop and lift the eggs. They would carry on plowing, but then they would go back to that spot and make up a kind of a new nest. Because I mean, the nests are not as you might think, all beautifully made of, of woven grass and such like. They're basically a scoop in the ground. Yeah, just a little <laughs> indentation. Just a scrape, basically. <laughs> so you put the eggs back, and, and they would be back there again, you know. That's really wonderful that they would do that. Yeah, yeah. And my, well, certainly my brother Jim always did that. I mm. think my dad did it as well. Um, <coughs> and... Um, there was times when the uh, when the there was uh, dung spreading going on in, in the fields with old dung spreaders that just fired out dung at the back of it. You know, not like the uh, slurry these days, which is all mixed up in tanks with water and sprayed out and stinks like <laughs> hell. This actually had quite a, a healthy smell about it, really. Um, but being big lumps of shit flying through the <laughs> air uh, was dangerous for eggs. Mm. And I, I was known to go out while they were doing that and actually 
shelter a nest with my body Aww. and like get my head done and be like thud 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 oh. bits of dried dung hitting you in the back you know and uh, <gasps> but I couldn't bear the thought of a nest being destroyed mm. you know that was no so you've been inspired by books and images and movies mm. and, and nature. Chakanori. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That was one of the major influences with this, you know, kids the program. Quality. Of they had actors that would read uh, a condensed version of a, a story. And my favourites were always uh, mythology. Uh, Roald Dahl, I loved. Yeah. And uh, folk tales. And remember, there was like Norwegian folk tales came on, and I was in raptures because I loved that, and I loved the Nordic stories. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was a big inspiration as well. Later on, when you were, I think, a teenager, maybe seventeen or so, you were staying in a trailer. What do you call it? Yeah, caravan. Caravan. Mm. Static caravan. Um. <laughs> Uh, and you said there was a book left there, which was Lord of the Rings. Mm -mm. No? Not quite. There was a book that was left there from the library, which I put back to the library. But I borrowed a friend of mine's copy of Lord of the Rings, first time I'd read it, mm -hmm. I was 18. And um, I thought it was amazing. Um, I had always thought that it was not something I could read because I wouldn't be smart enough to understand to follow a, a big book like that yeah. and I was reading it and it was just like it's just a story <laughs> you know uh, there's no kind of you know mysticism to it it's just a, it's a tale and I thoroughly enjoyed it mm -hmm. loved it um, still do read it many times mm -hmm. so yeah and then later on, I remember you telling me about going to Tam's bookshop, which is now mm. Sheena's, mm -hmm. Stromness Books and Prints. Mm. And what did you find there? Well, <coughs> Tam always had amazing books. And Tam always had a way of getting in just what I was kind of needing at that time in life. And... Uh, Two books that really stood out, I, I bought in one day, was a collection of Russian folk tales and also a collection of Osbjornsson and Moe's Norwegian folk tales. Mm. And they were beautifully illustrated. Well, the, the Osbjornsson and Moe one was beautifully illustrated with line drawings. And um, I was hooked. So I used to buy folk tale books from him, I was had been working in archaeology in Orkney, but I was kind of just a bit of a drifter and not doing anything, and unemployed and just picking up wee bits of jobs here and there. No goal in life whatsoever, and uh, but just discovered I really loved folk tales, and then one day there was a guy that I used to dig with. At the Broch at Hal outside Stromness. That was your first dig, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I was 17 when I, when I was working there. And I was digging with a guy called Dave Bissett, who came from Fort Rose in the Black Isle. And I used to go down and visit him occasionally. And one day when I was sort of down there, one evening, he said, I know there's an old couple that come from Orkney so we could go and visit them and they lived in a big house and they were um, really really nice I mean not exactly an Orkney accent but nowhere to be seen uh, just sort of that well educated kind of voice that could come from anywhere basically mm. but really really nice people you know and the guy was called Erland Clouston and I had no idea who the hell he was. And he said, well, what are you interested in, you know, other than archaeology? And I said, well, I'm, you know, folklore. I said, and I've, you know, trying to find something to, you know, 
because I'd just been watching Chasing in the Argonauts a few years before mm. that, and that got me at a time a really bad turn in my life. That got me reading mythology again, mm. Greek mythology. Um, Would that be a Ray Harryhausen? It was oh. indeed. 1963, same as me. <laughs> <laughs> we both came out the same year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <coughs> but he asked if I had read Ernest Marlick's Folklore Orton and Shetland, and I hadn't. This was about 1982, I think. So I would have been 19, probably, at that time. And I s confessed that I hadn't, because I didn't have many books at all, you know. And um, so he said, well, I'll lend you my copy, and I'm coming up to Orkney uh, in a few months, so you can give it back to me then. So we, I you know, gave him my phone number, and I read it, and it was the first time that I'd read the name Walter Trail Dennison. And he was a man who collected Orkney folk tales in Sandy in the 19th century and who would have a profound effect on my life, but I didn't know it at the time. Mm. And um, one day I got a phone call. It was Ireland. He was staying at the, Storm, at the Cripple Hotel. Went there, went up to his room, gave him his book back, thanked him. He got out a bottle of whiskey. We had a dram. And uh, off I went. Now, I had no idea who this man was. But many, many years later, working at the museum, I was actually covering uh, for a curator who was on maternity leave. Um, a lot of stuff came in from this family, and it was Ellen Clouston's family. Mm. Uh, it was his daughter had put things to the museum, including f a family album. And then I discovered that he was the son of Joseph Storer Clouston, the novel writer and historian who lived at Smogro, who's an, an author and was like a big name in Orkney. Um, some of his, uh, his novels were actually turned into movies. You know, I mean, he, wow. was, he, was, a, he was a big name. Very popular as a, uh, an author in his day, completely forgotten now, mm. mind you. But I but ended worth up looking up for people who haven't. Yeah, and I mean his his um, he made a major contribution to Orkney's uh, heritage as well through his um, you know history of Orkney book from 1932 and also um, various articles in the uh, Proceedings of the Orkney Antiquarian Society. So, I mean, he was, he was a, a big figure. And um, and this was his son? Or this was son? his son. His son. Yeah, his youngest son. Um, and I ended up seeing the wedding photograph of him as a young naval officer in World War Two, with his beautiful wife, who was the old woman that I had oh. met. 40 years later. Um, but uh, they were, uh, yeah, a wedding photo with him uh, with all his medals. And she was in a lovely white silk dress and carrying uh, like a bunch of white orchids. Mm. And I ended up um, cataloging his medals wow. and taking his medals into the collection. Um, so it's all these interconnected yeah. links. That you would have you know. had no idea when you were, when you first met him, just as a nice man that you happened to be introduced to. Mm -hmm. No, I had no idea who he was. And he also introduced you to. Inadvertently, he dr in introduced me to Walter Trail Dennison. So you know that was a, a major um, thing as well. So fast forward a few years six years to 88, and I start work at the museum. In Kirkwall? In Kirkwall, at the Orkney Museum. Called the Tankiness House Museum at that time. Because it's Tankiness House. It's in Tankiness <laughs> House, is the name of the building that it's housed in. Um, and working with Bryce Wilson. And in he started getting me to write and research exhibitions. And that, for me at the time, was 
just like being asked to pull all your teeth out <laughs> yourself. Here's a pair of pliers. Get on. With a little it, painful. Uh, painful and scary, mm -hmm. and um, just quite overwhelming, really, because I couldn't write. I I struggled with writing because of the dyslexia. Um, I could read fine in that time, but writing and spelling was just like, no, don't do that. Um, but then I was made to do a little, I wasn't made, I was asked to do a little display about the bar game and, and about that. And, and then the um, 1994 was going to be the centenary of the death of Walter Trill Dancing. And he said, you like folklore and your dad's for Sandy, same as this guy, you can write it. <laughs> and I had no idea how you go about creating an exhibition, but I saw it was a case like learning to swim by being thrown off the end of the pier, mm -hmm. you know. So but it was also, it sounds to me that there was somebody who thought you could do this, even if you didn't think you could do it yourself. Bryce believed that you could. He did, yeah. Um, it was um, um, quite flattering, really, I suppose, in a way. Terrifying, as you say. And, um, but anyway, we did the exhibition, which started in Sandy, uh, with a concert there and such like. And um, by this time, I had been getting into doing a bit of storytelling. I was asked by a friend of mine who ran the Kirkwall uh, Youth Hostel if I would do some storytelling for a group of Dutch students. There was about 60 kids who wanted to hear some Orkney folk tales, and there was nobody in Orkney that was telling stories or knew Orkney stories. So I ended up going there and doing that and told them stories for about an hour or so. Uh, absolutely terrified, you know. Mm. And I, was, I had to go and give talks to organizations as well and and it just scared the crap out of me oh, you know yes i can imagine that I, I, I used to feel the same way hmm. i think i actually quit high school because i had two presentations that i had to be given before the class hmm. do <laughs> like well that's it i'm out of here hmm. well, <laughs> but that's you. another story i beat you to it because <laughs> I, I walked out of school in 1977 when i was 14 and never yeah, went so back Congratulations, that's pretty impressive. Mm. <laughs> yeah, they tried to put me in uh, in, a, in a little, you know, hostel or chubby center or whatever, but <laughs> nah, it was the man they couldn't hang, you know, <laughs> or the boy they couldn't hang, no matter how much they would love to. <laughs> anyway, that's but, another but Here story. we are back in the, the present at that time when you were terrified yeah. to be speaking in front of people and yeah. sort of pushed into public speaking of mm -hmm. different sorts. So it's not something that comes easy, you know, or comes natural to people. I mean, mm -hmm. to some people, it probably is very natural. Not to me. Mm -hmm. um, I used to start getting, starting to feel physically sick before events, you mm -hmm. know. And it would build up to like the week beforehand. It was almost like being constantly seasick. Mm -hmm. uh, and the day of it itself, you know, you were just, you know, so nervous, you know, it was ridiculous. But once you got up and started doing it, uh, that all fell away from you, and, and you went, I like this, you mm. know. Do you think it was because you were actually prepared, because you loved the stories, even though you were nervous about the telling of them in public? Well, it was getting up in front of people, being looked at, you know. But how did the, how did, do you, Maybe you don't have any ideas about, but how did the nervousness go away when you started speaking? I just found my confidence mm -hmm. and uh, found my voice, and I was, you know, uh, it didn't bother me anymore. But it wasn't easy for you, and you said this went on for quite some time until yeah. you eventually got used to it, mm -hmm. and you weren't now, you, it doesn't bother you at all Not to get up, which might be encouraging to some people who are maybe just starting out thinking about storytelling or I think that if anybody gets up you know says that they can just get up in front of a group of people that they've never seen before 
and tell a story. If they say that they weren't nervous, they're either a bloody liar or a fool. Mm -hmm. Because it is not a natural thing to do, basically. Um, if you're playing an instrument, at least you've got something to hide behind. With storytelling, you've got nothing to right. hide behind. It's just you and the audience, and you have to get them on board and, and on your side. They won't always be on board. They sometimes maybe not have the reaction that you would prefer. You you tell me sometimes about a, an older woman. Well, this was all... <laughs> this comes slightly later down the line because... Um, with the Walter Child Denison thing, we had done the exhibition, but we also did a book, which came out the following year in April uh, 1995, called Orkney Folklore and Sea Legends by Walter Child Denison, which I collected. Those. Collected. I well, he he wrote the book. I mean, you know, he mm -hmm. wrote the stories, published in the 1890s. But they were based on actual legends yeah, and things. Yeah, they were things. what he had gathered. Right. And um, so um, I ended up having all of those brought together and published by Orkney Press and um, then went off to Norway um, with the exhibition as well. It was at the University Library in Bergen. And I also did a short storytelling session, you know, for some of the the people from the university and the local uh, communa, the local authority. Um, but then I was asked by Aberdeen University if I would give a talk on Walter Trail Denison's folklore. And I said, no, I'll do one on Orkney folklore because Denison only published sea stories he had plenty of stories about you know fairies and uh, trows and um, giants and whatnot there would have been plenty of that but he was had this remit from the scottish antiquary to do sea stories mm -hmm. and so that's what he did um uh so it was lacking an important element of orkney folklore so I said I would do that. I would just do the, uh, you know, the, the whole kit and caboodle. And it started in Strumness. The first one was at the Pier Art Centre. And they decided from that as to whether they wanted to put me on the evening, um, like the winter program of lectures. And they wanted an illustrated lecture. Now, after... I had dragged Bryce <laughs> out of retirement as an artist, kicking and screaming, to do the illustrations for the Denison book and the exhibition. And he got into it and he said, you know, like, what what do we do next? <laughs> and I said, well, I've always been waiting for somebody to do a book of Orkney folk tales, and nobody's done it and nobody is working in folklore. Mm. So I guess if we don't do it, nobody will. So that's how that one started. Mermaid Bride was born on that day. Which has just had its 25th anniversary 25th edition. 25th anniversary last year. Yeah, last April. So, we're so there's a, new, a whole there. new edition because you added several new stories. There's and three places. new stories, but there's a lot of extra illustrations yeah. going on. Uh, including those ones done for the Denison book and, and the exhibition. Um, so... I was kind of sheltered a bit. I'm nervous as hell, but I was at the back of the crowd with them facing the opposite way oh. because I had this old carousel projector that belonged to Bryce mm -hmm. with these slides of his images and went through them that way. So I didn't have to stand up in front of a, a group of people. Could stand the back of them. <laughs> I could stand at the <laughs> that back was of helpful. them. That helpful. Um, which was slightly better. But um, but then I started getting asked to go back and do things, and uh, so I um, ended up um, going along to the the reference that you made earlier was uh, an 
old folks kind of club that got together. And I went along, was invited to go along and do this talk anyway, which I did. And at the end of it, there was the, you know, a round of applause. And then when the, the applause stopped, this one old woman said in a very loud voice for everybody to hear, because, of course, that was the whole point of it. Well, if that's the best they can do, I won't be coming back next week. <laughs> and the hostility that I faced with trying to bring these old Orkney stories back to the public again that was must quite surprised. It, it did, and it was all older people. Mm. Because they were brought up to believe that this was all rubbish and superstition and should be left in the past. I think maybe they were a bit embarrassed. I think it was just that kind of... I mean, the church had done a number on it from the mid-19th century where you, you know, like these stories were superstition and superstition was the work of the devil. So it was there to, to confuse people, to trip them up. Um, to lead them into sinful ways. So telling the stories was kind of seen as being sort of sinful, you know. It was also a time when a lot of people, for instance, in these gorgeous old houses with, you know, wonderful staircases with curly, uh, what do you call them? The, not the rungs. The balustrades. Well, no, anyway. Ban um, yeah, banister. And, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, everything that was characteristic and, and gorgeous about the house was being covered up, made yeah, kind oh of yeah. plain, and mm -hmm. all the doors were having plywood put over them so it wouldn't show that they had these wonderful old-fashioned segments in them, you know, the six-part. Mm. All better than plywood, it was hardboard. So it was like a kind of a, a stronger cardboard, basically. So it was a time when people <clears throat> were mm -hmm. covering up the past and, and trying mm. to be modern, maybe, Yeah. to the... Nobody forgetting wanted, about yeah, nobody wanted panelled doors. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm incredibly proud of upstairs. We've still got chorch and doors. You know, this this house of of ours dates to the late 1700s, and some of the original doors are still on upstairs. The downstairs, there's Victorian ones for some reason, mm -hmm. the four panels, but the upstairs got the six panels, and I love that. But you know, it was a very different thing. That after the war, people looked at building a new world for themselves right, as well. Yeah. And so things, they wanted to be nice and shiny and modern. Get rid of all this old brown furniture. Throw out the old table that you've been having meals at for a hundred years. And get a nice one with a formica top <laughs> that you can wipe <laughs> clean, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there was a, a big change in, in attitudes in society. But... I did come across a lot of that. There was one old guy said to me, why are you bothering with an old dirt? You know, meaning like old shit. Mm -hmm. And I said, because I like you know dirt. And um, apparently, as it turns out, a <coughs> lot of other people do as well. They did, yeah. Given the chance. Yeah, so when Ed Bragg came out in uh, 98, and um, I did a wee book the following year called Storm Witch for the Westry um, Heritage, heritage uh, Trust for uh, their little heritage centre just to raise money for them. Bryce illustrated it. It's still well. available there, isn't it? At the yeah, you can get it from like, the Arcadian Bookshop and, and from the Westry Heritage Centre. It's still on the go. Uh, it'll be its 25th anniversary this year, in fact. Hmm. Uh, that was just because I'd bought a computer for the first time and I was learning how to use the damn thing and thought this would be a project, you know. But um, but then the big kind of game changer came when I was up a step ladder in the museum one day hanging an exhibition and this rather glamorous blonde lady comes in. <laughs> and She'll be so happy to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well... She um, said to Bryce, he said, are you Tom Muir? And he said, no, he's, he's, up, the, he's up the ladder, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so she introduced herself as Sheila Fechney, who worked at the, um, uh, the tourist board, as was at the time. And uh, she always loved storytelling and used to do artwork because she's an artist, well, extremely good artist. Mm -hmm. um, 
and she did s- work for posters for the Scottish Storytelling Centre in Edinburgh. Oh, did she? I didn't mm-hmm. realise that. Yeah. Mm. And so she said, I had this idea, the tourist board are looking at a way of extending the... Um, the the season, you know, and, and a bit later, and so have something for people to do. So she thought a storytelling festival, and they'd got a little bit of money. She had tried to get David Campbell originally to come up, but he couldn't do it at that date. Uh, so she contacted Donald Smith at the Storytelling Centre, and he said, Lawrence Tullock's your man up in Shetland. So this guy came in who I never heard of before. And she said, would I come along to this event? And uh, it was in the Stromnitz Hotel, in the still room. Um, yeah, what, is, what is the still room? The still room, well, it's a little, it's a little room with a fire in it that oh. had a bar that it was stocked full of whiskies, different whis- oh. different malt whiskies. And um, so I went there along with Marita Luke, who is a German lady who lives in Orkney and is a storyteller mm-hmm. as well and is on our committee with the festival and all that. Of course. Part of the festival. Yeah, absolutely. Still. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she was going out and um, I gave her a lift from Kirkwall because I was living in Kirkwall. And we came out and she went and sat and spoke to Lawrence. And I had uh, this in, this, this professional storyteller. I didn't know there was any professional storytellers. <laughs> I had this naive, um, <coughs> you could call it egotistical, but it wasn't. It was just dumb, simple as that. I thought I was like the only storyteller. Not dumb, uninformed. Well, you just, didn't just know. ignorant. <laughs> I was ignorant of the fact that there was a scene. There were festivals. People were doing this, this for a, a living. Yeah. I thought it was just like me going around with my old bag of stories and you know. Your projector. <laughs> no, I wasn't using it at that time because I was just I was telling stories just on the hoof. Um. So. The first story that I did, I told two stories. The first one was Assy Partly and the Stuart one. Mm. And Lawrence fell in love with it. Oh, she hadn't heard it before. No. Oh. Uh, and he described our meeting, like he says, it's, it's passed into folklore, <laughs> into legend. It's like the meeting between uh, Stanley and Livingston, you know, mm. and Dr. Livingston, I presume, and all that. Uh, he says, this guy comes, he thought, this guy would look like kind of one of the Orkney intelligentsia, <laughs> swanned into the room and completely ignored them and went and sat at the bar and got a, <laughs> got a beer and um, and just like ignored them. And he thought, well, oh, what a shit, you know, <laughs> um, standoffish, you know. I was actually really shy. I mean, I'm not, I can be quite gregarious, given a drink or two. Mm. Left to my own devices, I just kind of stay in the corner and, Mm. you know, mind my own business. And I, there was this professional storyteller, so I just went and sat at the bar. Because you didn't belong with him. No. Why would I be going and, you know, talking to, to him? You know, he would he would sort of, you know, see me as pond-like, you know? So you thought. Yeah. So, anyway, told a couple of stories. Um, he did a couple of uh, stints. Marita told stories. And then there was an open mic thing where it, there was lots of people got up and told things. It was usually more life stories than anything else, mm-hmm. but um, but then I went and sat down next to Lawrence, and we started chatting, and he said, I love that story, never had that one before, and it became Lawrence's favorite story, 
It's kind of surprising because Orkney and Shetland have so many similarities and such a common root as far as the people. Well, yeah. I'm surprised he didn't know the Storholm or some version of it. Yeah, but the thing is, he. Um, the thing is that these stories just were not available. Mm. So you had to go and look for an out of print book that would not be easy to track down. Remember, this was before the internet, or right, the internet right. was just, it was a thing, but it was very in its embryonic stages. Not really available for people yet. And people weren't buying things online. Mm -hmm. And um, But Lawrence did have a lot of stories passed down orally through his family. Lawrence got his stories from his dad, Tom Tullock, who got them from his mother, who got them from her, you know, whatever. But they didn't parent. know the, the creation. Myth. It's an Orkney story, yeah. so it wasn't in Shetland. Okay. And um, so Lawrence, although I didn't know it at the time, was going to end up being my brother in storytelling and, and my brother in all but blood. You know, we, we were family. Yeah. I loved the man. And uh, his untimely death in 2017 was just heartbreaking and stunning and but the lovely thing is that his daughter Liz is now starting to be a storyteller as well and I'm encouraging her and doing whatever I can to help her along that journey but she doesn't need anything she's from me. She's got the DNA. She's <laughs> good, yeah, she can do the standing on her head. And she can play the fiddle. Yeah she can stand on her head play the fiddle <laughs> and tell stories you know. A wee slug of whiskey. Um, so yeah, it was. Um, so that was the first time that you realized there could be, there that there was a storytelling scene that yeah. you maybe could be part of. No, I never thought of that. I just didn't know that there was such a thing. And um, so, how did you did you just start getting invited places? Well, Lawrence said that they had wanted to start the Storytelling Festival in Shetland. Okay. And it was being planned. And then we had beat them by a year in 2000. Uh, this was done. Um, thanks to Sheila Fechney. So the following year, um, I was invited to go to Shetland and traveled around the islands and, and told stories there and, and met quite a few other storytellers, including George McPherson from Sky, who then invited me to the Sky Festival. Mm -hmm. And we had a, a bigger festival in Orkney in 2021, which included Bob Pegg. And Bob invited me down to his festival, Tales at Martinmas, in, in the Highlands. So, and then <coughs> 20... Um, 2002, I was invited to the national, you know, the Scottish, and well, now the Scottish International <laughs> Storytelling <laughs> Festival. Back in those days, it was just the Scottish. <laughs> yeah, the Scottish <laughs> Storytelling Festival. It's grown. <laughs> yeah. And. Um, in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. It was me and Lawrence were to go down, but. I had, initially I had agreed, but um, I couldn't do it for personal reasons. Now, uh, my marriage had just broken up and I was living with my son. And I couldn't just, you know, say, right, well, I've done my parenting for the mm -hmm. last few months. So, you know, said to my wife, have, have the boy back while I go off and have fun. You know, that's not what you do when you're a parent. That's right. So I contacted Donald and I said, look, I'm sorry, I can't do this this year. And I remember Marita saying to me, are you mad? And I said, ah, keep them clean. They'll be back. <laughs> and they were a couple of years later, um, by which time I had my own pet Viking, uh, Hjörleifur Helgi Stephenson from Iceland. Was Not many people can say that. Oh, he says, oh, it's a wonderful name. <laughs> and it's about, it's most, about the most Icelandic thing you can say. Hjörleifur Helgi Stephenson. <laughs> and 
I mean the pet Viking part. <laughs> oh, pet Viking part. Well, yeah. It's, although most people can't say his name either. Uh, well, I never had any trouble with pets around the house when I had him there. You know. <laughs> it's always good to have a pet Viking going around. <laughs> and uh, he was, again, a man that had learned stories from his grandparents. And... Um, a wonderful storyteller, one of my favorite storytellers. He's is very, Florida. very natural and good yeah. looking. And a singer as well. Yeah. And good looking. Oh, and so good and looking. <laughs> <laughs> makes you bloody <laughs> sick. But anyway, um, <laughs> he was staying with me and we got invited back in 2004. And I said, you should come down with me and, you know, get in and get to see other storytellers and we had arranged a little session in just a friend's who was just in Bryce's house mm -hmm. brought a few folk together so that he could tell stories in front of the strangers um, and so that went very well mm -hmm. I mean it was just like a story but it was a step you know yeah. and then we ended up done in Edinburgh and first night we went to the Good Crack Club um, <coughs> at the Waverley, mm -hmm. which is like a pub where this is where Billy Connolly kind of used to go when he was a young folky, you know, mm -hmm. the humble bums used to play up there. Him and Cherry Rafferty used to play in the same room that we were in. Yeah, you know. I've been there. <laughs> been there. <laughs> and uh, so we went, went there and I said uh, to Donald, can this young guy tell a story tonight? And um, so the guy that was doing the, the emceeing, the fear and kai, as they say, he was um, prompted. And he only ever got up and he told the story of the merman laughed. Mm -hmm. And it's a fabulous story. And his version from the family has got a bit of a twist in it that's not in the books, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was up there telling the story, bags of confidence, because mm. he's Icelandic. Icelandic, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you get that. Yeah, <laughs> I've met Icelanders now. And, um, <laughs> but he was stunningly good, and I was watching the audience's reaction. Mm. They, he had them in the palm of his hand, and the one person that I noticed most was Duncan Williamson. Mm. Duncan was sitting right down at the front, in front of us, and he had his chin on his fists, you know, leaning his, his chin on, on his two fists. And his mouth was like a wee polo mint, you know, it's just <laughs> like a, a, a wee circle. He was just like, ooh, <laughs> listening to the story. And I thought, he's got him. Mm -hmm. And if he's got Duncan Williamson, the famous great traveler storyteller, mm -hmm. then by God, he's ready for anything. Mm -hmm. And so I told Donald that he was coming on with us one night and um, so he did. You told Donald? Yeah. I said, we're not asking permission, we're telling you what we're doing. Donald's always been very easygoing with you. Donald is just, I mean, there is a man that deserves some kind of an honor. As a Republican and a nationalist, you probably wouldn't want a knighthood. <laughs> but, I mean, he deserves something in recognition for what he's done for, for Scottish storytelling. He does. He's um, and the storytelling centre there has become the kind of template for every other storytelling centre in the world. Mm. And, um, and he has the best laugh in the world. Oh, yeah. Knock you, knock you off your, so your <laughs> socks. But um, he said, well, as long as the other ones are happy enough with that, that's fine. So I said, oh, yeah, because they all knew him. And we'd been in Iceland and we'd met him, you see. Me and Lawrence, uh, Bob Pegg and Heather Yule mm -hmm. had all been in Iceland. Another great storyteller. Absolutely, with heart player. Mm -hmm. And so we all knew each other. And so then he only ever came on, told the story, blew everyone away, as usual. <laughs> Sang Rima as well, his yeah. old old folk songs and then when I was finished I spot David Campbell was at the back and I went well what are you thinking of the boy and he goes he's very good and I said yeah and you know something 
that's the first time that he's been up in front of an audience. You know, apart from one night at the Good Crack Club, it's the first time that he's done a storytelling session. And he went, no. <laughs> yep. So that was that was the that was your labor. But and then after that, I was involved with an EU project, Destination Viking Sagalands. Travelled all around Scandinavia. Was so this because of your storytelling or because or through the museum? It was through the museum, but I ended up being me and Davy Cooper for Shetland ended up being in charge of the storytelling element of the project. Okay. Because it was um, it was about using Icelandic sagas as a way of promoting tourism. Mm. Which and now everybody is doing using stories to promote yeah museums and to help out people understand because we think in stories mm, but we had uh, uh our own icelandic saga mm -hmm. in orkney the orkney Inga saga and so that was um um that could be used as a marketing ploy for tourism and so this was building on that but also i got in there because the, it was kind of like oh and storytelling and it was very much the poor relative right but I was able to promote it to such an extent. And also I just got on with the people and they had a real laugh. And I was kind of the wild bastard out of the group, you know, and always, you know, with bottles of whiskey and a, la and a good laugh. So still the Faroe Island boy? Oh, yeah. I've never changed in for that perspective at all. Um, so it was a fabulous and world expanding event and then that led to meeting other people like uh, Katarina Jovancic from Slovenia who I'd just come back from Greenland and I'd gone properly feral <laughs> and um Were you hairy yeah well almost <laughs> and uh there was uh, a homecoming from uh Cree First Nation people from Canada and one of them was Joseph Naterhal, and mm -hmm. Joseph was up on the stage singing this call and response song. So he would kind of, he would sing and he had the reply. Now, you know what Arcadians are like with I do. audience <laughs> participation, you know, it's like, <laughs> and everybody together, all together now. And it's like silence. Crickets, if you had them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tumbleweed blowing across the floor. If you had it. <laughs> Everybody's suddenly fascinated by their shoes, you know, <laughs> staring at the floor. Twiddling thumbs. And I thought, oh, bloody hell, you know, that's that poor man, you know, he's hanging up there. <laughs> so I started bellowing away back to him. And this woman who I'd never met before in my life turned around, uh, who was up for the Science Festival, yeah. and said, you know, oh, you've got a good voice. And I went, oh, blush, blush, thank you. And, uh, and then just we got talking and... This was Kat, who ended up being like a, a wee sister a for wee mine. Sister. Yeah, so. And a singer, so she knows what she's talking oh, about when well she says you have a good yeah, voice. Well, Again, with the voice. Oh, people are sick of that. <laughs> but yeah, so that's kind of, you know, all these one thing leads to another. So she spent ages pushing to get me to Slovenia because they'd had a bit of a bad experience with an English storyteller who had gone along and self-proclaimed master storyteller and uh, yeah. yeah i mean i've been termed a master storyteller by people like donald by Smith. other people yeah <laughs> and it's kind of i find it a bit embarrassing but you can put up where tradition bearer i struggle with a bit but then i was called that by stanny robertson who mm. um stanny was another great traveler storyteller and what a man mm -hmm. you know um, read me fortune once hmm. at Bob Pegg's house. When what did he say? We'd had we'd had quite a lot of whiskey really? by this time. I know it's hard to believe, <laughs> but um, but Stanley, of course, didn't because he was a Mormon, right. and so. But what he did drink gallons of every day was Diet Coke, which has got more caffeine in it <laughs> than just like eating coffee, you know. But you didn't have the heart to let him know no, that. No, no, no. Nobody, <laughs> nobody did, you know, because everybody loved Stanley. Um, but Stanley says, how do your hands, boys? As in, you know, so fingertips up. 
and he just touched the tips of my finger and he says, you're going to get a piano. And I said, pardon? He says, you're going to get a piano. Not I what said, you were expecting I'm, to hear? Yeah, I said, I'm going to get a piano. <laughs> but I can't play the piano. He goes, doesn't matter, you're going to get one anyway. <laughs> and a birdcage. And I went, what? There's a birdcage or something like a birdcage. And I said, so let me get this right, Stanley. I'm going to get a piano playing budgie. <laughs> he goes, well, that's what I see. He goes, might take a while, might be years, but you will do. So, um, many years later, I bought that. But you're, you're looking at it. I'll take a corner. picture of it. I'll there's put it on a, YouTube. There's a lantern. Um, which is from an old navigational boy. It's made of brass and copper. And these things were being scrapped. And um, this was sold, possibly under the counter, by the Northern Lighthouse Board. I didn't ask any questions. <laughs> I just paid for it and took it back and stripped all the paint off it. And, you know, there it sits. But it does look like a birdcage. And then a few years ago, we bought Jennifer Rigby's piano, mm -hmm. electric piano, for you, because mm -hmm. you play piano. Mm -hmm. So it did take a few years, it but did. he was right. He was. <laughs> uh, he was quite a... Never question a traveler. Mm -hmm. He was quite a character. She had a room with him in Shetland, and uh, he, would, he would say, oh, I'm off his sail this morning, loon. He would say, oh. He legs is off his sail, and he backs off his sail, and he heads off his sail. And <laughs> he would list off all the body parts of his sore. <laughs> and, um, but he had uh, diabetes, but he was scared of needles. Aww. So he wouldn't get insulin. And eventually we managed to persuade him um, to use it with, it was child's needles, mm. so it was like for Bern's really peedy one. It's because I have such affy, thin, fine veins, he would tell oh. me, you know. And it was just the, the way, a way of getting him to use it, because he needed to use mm. it, you know. And he could come across as being quite kind of, you know, doer and, you know, but by God, you put him on stage and he came alive. Mm. What a storyteller. Amazing. I'm so privileged to have known people and worked with people like Sheila Stewart and Ren Essie Stewart and uh, Chess Smith um, and Stanley. And while I've told stories, we don't lungs and we never did it on stage together, but we we swapped stories over a dram, mm -hmm. you know. In fact, it's funny because there's so many folk that look at storytelling as being some mystic thing, you know. Mm. Do they do they draw down the spirits and they things like that? Do all that <laughs> sort of stuff. And uh, I remember Bob Pegg saying once, <laughs> after one of his festivals, you know, and they're all sitting there having a having a drink, and Duncan used to drink special brews, mm. and he said, "This is what it's about, Bob. This is what it's about." Fags and tins, fags and tins. <laughs> so, <laughs> like cigarettes and cans of, of super lager right. or, or special brew in, in his view. That's so, the reward. Yeah. But the festival that we had started up kind of went into decline. And well, because we just... We it takes a lot of work. It takes a huge amount of work and we just didn't have the people and we got different jobs and... Sheila had left Orkney, and um, so that kind of took the heart out of it as well. And uh, and then in 2010, I got a visit at the museum from uh, Fran Flett Hollenwake, uh, who was working as a tour guide at the time. And now, uh, the curator of the the St Magnus Cathedral. Um, Curator of the collection there and also research. So, but anyway, she said that she had this idea about restarting the festival and wanted me on board. And I said, Well, we've actually still got money in the bank, um, which has just been sitting there for years. And so that got reactivated. And then the festival began again from then and has 
going from strength to strength. So I don't know what the future holds because I mean we are looking at stepping back from it because it's just so it's much work. work. It's <laughs> a huge amount of work, and mm. you know, so I just I, I can't do everything. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's. But yeah, I have travelled the world um, from Nunavut in Arctic Canada, the Inuit homeland. Told stories there, all the way from there to Hong Kong. It's a little scrappy island boy who wouldn't go to school. Mm hmm Come a long way. Yeah. Do you have any words of counsel for maybe young storytellers or new storytellers who... Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what they want to hear. <laughs> well, you know, it's when you get people saying, well, I was, you know, we were we were tutoring these people and now we're losing work to them, you know. Mm -hmm. So you go kind of, if you want someone to survive, you need yeah. young people. You need new blood. Mm -hmm. um, listen, I've got not one qualification to my name. Mm -hmm. I can't ride a bike, never had one when I was a kid, so I don't have a, a cycle proficiency test, <laughs> and I can't swim, so I don't even have a certificate for being able to swim the length of a bloody swimming pool. I've and got you quit school when you were 14. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> and dyslexic, but I write books, and I'll publish as well, of course, mm -hmm. thanks to yourself, and um, basically, if I can do it, so can you. Ah, that's good. Yeah. No, it's true. Yeah. I mean, it, if I can do it, there is nobody, there is nothing stopping anybody else from, from doing it. Mm. Don't worry about being nervous. That's natural. That is quite natural. It's quite good as well, actually. Keeps you on your toes. Mm. But I become a different person when I get up on stage and start telling stories. I mean, it's like somebody else takes over, you know. A lot of actors say that, too. Mm. You find the words that if you were just trying to think, you know, sitting doing by the fireside with a cup of tea, you would you would kind of struggle. But when you're put on the spot, it kind of unleashes your inner poet as well. Um, you know, so yeah, don't give up. Um, give it a go. Might not be for you. Might be the best thing that you've ever done in your life. But don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I would say, though, if you want to be a storyteller, is your motivation. Why do you want to do it? Mm -hmm. you got to do it because you love the stories. And if you think it's all about adulation and people clapping you and such like, you're missing the point. The most important thing is not you, it's the stories. Now, the way that you tell them, that will come across right. as well in it. Um, but if you love the stories and you know the stories and you cherish them, then you can't go wrong. Mm -hmm. But don't get into the ego thing that it's all about me. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. <laughs> it's all about the yeah. stories. I think as an audience member only, because <laughs> mm. people often ask me if I'm a storyteller too, no, I'm not. But I love to listen, and the ones that strike me most deeply are are those who I, you can just tell they're ju they just love the stories, and it's they're having such fun mm. sharing it. It's yeah. because it's important to them, mm -hmm. and it's also about kindness, about sharing. You want to share this story with somebody else because you love it, mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah. I mean, there's no big secret as to how you can do it. Mm -hmm. It's just a case of you need experience, you need practice, you mm -hmm. need to do it again just and like again anything, and again. Just like anything, any skill. Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, at the, but at the crux of it all is the love of, of story. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thanks for listening to that a rambling session there. I thought I would just end up by telling you a wee story because that is kind of what I'm supposed to be doing, I guess, as a storyteller. Um, I mentioned earlier 
about digging at Broch Hau outside Stromness. I should just explain, this is the, f- the first time um, that I had worked on any archaeological site. I was 17 years old, hadn't a clue about anything. I mean, really, really clueless. Uh, but there was this huge mound, and the name of the farm, how came from it. Because in Old Norse, the name is Haug, and it means a mound. And there was a huge mound by the side of this farm building, this farmhouse. Now, there was a folk tale attached to it, which I had none the wiser of when I went there. They said that there was two men in Orthor who were heading to Stromness to buy whiskey for Hogmanay. And they walked our, the road past How, down into Kirsten, into Stromness. And they went to one of the d- wee distilleries here and bought whiskey. There was official distilleries and there was unofficial distilleries as well. But they had a pig with them, not a wee grunting mammal, but a pig is a stoneware chair. And they filled the pig with whiskey, put cork in the top, and they headed off back up the road, up Kirsten Road, up our how. And as they got near the, the farm of how, they could hear music. There was music coming from the mound. Curious about this, they went to investigate, and they saw that there was a door standing wide open in the side of that huge mound. And that there was the sound of a party in full swing going on inside. And that's where the music was coming from. The light was pouring out through the doorway. And they looked in and there was all the wee fairies dancing away, all the wee trowies, all dancing away like mad. And the man with a pig of whiskey on his back stepped inside and started to dance. Now his friend waited for him for a while, but he never came out. And he used to go and shout to him, you know, are you not coming out yet? And he goes, ah, wait till the reel's over, he's dancing away. Are you not coming out yet? Ah, wait till the reel's over. Well, this happened a few times, and in the end, the other guy got fed up and thought, well, I'm going home, I'm cold, I'm uh, not going into the fairy mountain, I'm going to go home. And I'll, he'll catch up with me, in a, you know, fairly soon. So he went back home, but the other guy never did catch up with him. He never came. And people went and looked for him, and they went back to that mound at How, And there was no trace of a doorway there, and no music, no nothing. A year passed, and the man was going from Orfer again back to Stromness to buy whiskey for New Year. It was on Hogmanay, New Year's Eve. And he went doing, and he got a pig of whiskey filled, and he went up Kirsten Road, our the bray to how, and he heard a familiar sound, music playing. So he headed towards the music, same tune as he'd heard the year before, and there was the doorway standing wide open, and when he looked inside, there was his pal dancing away. And he said, are you not coming out yet? And his friend said, wait till the reel's finished. Well, the man stretched in and grabbed his pal by the collar and dragged him out. And he said, what did you do that for? He says, you've been in there for a while, man. No, I haven't, he says. I just started dancing that reel. He says, you've been in there for over a a year now. No, I haven't. He said, look at your feet, man. So he looked down at his feet, and sure enough, he had danced the soles off his shoes. It was just the uppers flapping around. And what was worse was the pig of whiskey on his back was empty. You just can't trust those trows. And the interesting thing is, is when when I went to work at Howe in 1980, when I was 17, 
the uh, old folk had said when they started digging there in 1978 that, oh, no good will come of that. It's a fairy mound. And that winter, there was a terrible storm. I believe it was called Storm Katrina. But it's not the Storm Katrina that devastated Louisiana and, and um, such like in the, whenever that was, the beginning of the noughties, I think. But this was like, you know, 1980. But anyway, it was called Storm Katrina. And it flattened the fines hot. There was all the, the fines that had been found there in the plastic bags were all blown all over the place, and people were going around picking them off barbed wire fences for ages. Probably quite a few light pieces would have been lost anyway. But but the old folk just nodded wisely and said, Uh-huh, it was a fairy mound. What did they expect?